In a 12,000 word article for NBC News, Jane C. Tim chronicles the 141 distinct consecutive stances across 23 major issues that Donald Trump took and changed and dropped and took again during his presidential campaign. Looking at this list, it's impossible not to wonder how on earth Trump could possibly have won a presidential election. The self-contradictions are painfully clear. Looking at this list, it's easy to wonder whether Trump really knows what he wants, what he'll even do as president of the United States. The picture has always shimmered like a mirage, clumsily but effectively evading its critics because, to be honest, they just aren't permitted to see clearly enough to pin it down. As troubling as Trump's policy mirage may be, it's what lies underneath that disturbs me more. Because there is something we can trace here. Trump's policy mirage, the hundreds of anti-immigrant, anti-black, anti-woman, and other hate incidents recorded in the first 10 days post-election. The syncretism of joining incompatible platitudes, ideology, and religion into improvised, blunt objects. The emotional contortions made not only to defend Trump's history of sexual harassment and assault, but actually to approve of it while turning to denigrate Mexican and Muslim immigrants as incorrigible rapists. The white men accusing people of color who speak justice for the truly oppressed of being themselves racist against white people. The tortured thread tying these moving targets together is fascism. Now, I'm not going to start comparing Trump to Adolf Hitler. To be honest, I'm not that interested in the question of whether Trump is himself a fascist, even if, um, yeah, he is. Because fascism is not identical with authoritarianism, though it usually includes it. Fascism cannot be confined to a single individual, though it is inevitably channeled that direction. In fact, fascism is hard to pin down. And as semiotician Umberto Eco writes in his essay, Or Fascism, this is precisely what makes fascism what it is. What would that be, you ask? Well, we'll get there, but seeing what I've seen the past year and a half, suffice it to say for now that it seems to me fascism is, among other things, a technology of mythic signification. While in the United States we like to think of individual evil dictators as being the source of fascism, individuals like Benito Mussolini, Francisco Franco, Adolf Hitler, what Echo saw and describes, and what I find more useful to think about is how fascism's roots lie within the masses of people who follow such men. The roots of fascism are pre-political. Fascism exists in waiting, if you will, perhaps even dormantly, prior to its embodiment and expression, usually in a strongman. To write about what he calls ur-fascism, or eternal fascism, Echo draws on his experience growing up in 1930s and 40s Italy under Mussolini's actual fascist regime. We are not liable to see the same things Europe saw in Mussolini or Hitler or Franco in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Fascism appears differently at different times and places, but Echo observes a number of features that are constant. Even though political regimes can be overthrown, he writes, and ideologies can be criticized and disowned, behind a regime and its ideology there is always a way of thinking and feeling, a group of cultural habits, of obscure instincts, and unfathomable drives. Take note, fascism as a political and semiotic technology is built upon a substrate of ways of thinking and feeling, given form by underlying cultural habits, instincts, and drives. Fascism is therefore fuzzy. For Echo, the fascism he observed in Italy under Mussolini stood in contrast to Nazism. While Nazism had a single authoritarian aesthetic, a single architecture, a single political philosophy, fascism had a bundle of conflicting aesthetics, philosophies, and characters. If Nazism was unitary in its totalitarian culture, fascism was a collage structurally and philosophically confused and out of joint, but emotionally, it was glued together. I believe we can say the same about American fascism currently. American fascism is amoebic, capable of taking different forms simultaneously in order to avoid obstacles on different issues at the same time. Philosophically, American fascism is a collage of fragments. Emotionally, it coherently glues itself together with a sticky mixture of nationalism, racism, misogyny, and fear. To begin with, Ego writes, Ur-fascism's first characteristic is the cult of tradition, 
whose mystique requires that it be syncretistic, combining contradictory forms of beliefs or practice which, fascism can claim, each contain a sliver of wisdom, alluding allegorically to the same primeval truth. Consequently, there can be no learning or progress. Truth is already spelled out, a closed case. Therefore, fascism rejects many forms of social progress. Because it makes claims from some primeval and conveniently intangible truth, it can easily reject rationalism, criticism, and disagreement in favor of an impoverished vocabulary and reasoning. Because it draws on phallic drives of hypermasculine emotion and binary thinking, it fosters paranoia and fear of difference. A vision of life is defined by struggle and warfare over against pacifism. It devalues intellectualism as effeminate and holds contempt for those it sees as weak, especially women and people of color. It thus promotes myths of militant heroism and machismo. Since war is a difficult game, Echo writes, fascism transfers its will to power to sexual matters. And since even sex is its own difficult game, it tends to play with weapons as its own phallic exercise. Make no mistake, fascism is a technology in the same sense as is a barricade or a Molotov cocktail. It's a makeshift composite of pre-existing signs and objects and theories designed to direct energy and transform other objects. This machine systematically trivializes logical distinctions between what are fundamentally incompatible positions to synthesize myth. And it does this by construing a communicative scheme that over-legitimizes and mobilizes white male subjectivity. So, fascism can thus, without qualm, claim that its views are free of racism, and then invoke the hashtag All Lives Matter to blame the victims of police brutality for their own deaths, or criticize those supporting immigrants and minorities, but not, quote, everyday Americans. Fascism can, without qualm, denigrate feminists as waging a war on men, while literally cheering when their own candidate literally acknowledges and defends his own misogyny, harassment, and sexual assault. Fascism can, without qualm, attack what they call PC culture in schools and universities, blasting the idea of safe spaces while creating a list of professors they claim are shoving leftist ideas down students' throats. Ultimately, the fascist mode of myth is about subsuming, transforming, and redeploying signs and narratives in spite of their being totally incommensurate with each other in order to mobilize power in the register of racism, xenophobia, misogyny, and fatality. It would be so much easier for us, Echo concludes, if there appeared on the world scene somebody saying, I want to reopen Auschwitz. I want the black shirts to parade again in the Italian squares. Life is not that simple. Where fascism can come back under the most innocent of disguises, our duty is to uncover it and to point our finger at any of its new instances. So how do we begin to uncover fascism? Well, I believe one step we can take is to insist on discriminating among signs. When fascism adopts the narrative of the truly oppressed as its own myth, our work should involve pointing out the incommensurability of those signs and explaining why. When fascism promotes action fueled by hate and fear and anger, our work should involve critically unraveling and examining those emotions, both in our opponents and in ourselves. Because it's certain ur fascism stirs among us, and all it takes is saying nothing to become its agent. If fascism is a technology, then it's up to us to dismantle it however we can.